burning time. Just ahead on One Detroit, climate change and its impact on Detroit. We'll look at the flooding issues in the city and possible solutions. Plus, a future of work conversation on attracting young professionals to Michigan. Also ahead, a local student learns more about Islam during the holy month of Ramadan. And we'll have some ideas on what to do in Metro Detroit this weekend. It's all coming up next on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Just ahead on this week's One Detroit, our Future of Work series looks at the efforts to attract and retain the millennial workforce in Michigan. Plus, a religious diversity program takes a young student on a journey into the history of Islam. And Peter Worf of 90.9 WRCJ has some ideas on how to spend this weekend in Metro Detroit. But first up, it's Earth Month and we're examining the effects of climate change on Detroit neighborhoods. Heavy rains have caused streets and basements to flood on a regular basis, partially due to the city's aging infrastructure. One Detroit's Bill Kubota visits a hard-hit Jefferson Chalmers community on the east side and explores some solutions. Blake Granham lives on a canal down by the Detroit River, the Jefferson Chalmers neighborhood on the Lower East Side. Now, I've been over here my whole life. Jefferson Chalmers has been a secret and it's now not a secret anymore. It was just a little gem in the city where the canals run behind these houses and you have such a diverse neighborhood. But every time it rains, Granham documents what goes on in the streets. This is an ongoing problem and it needs to be resolved because of all the water that we're getting. Flood insurance in this low-lying area, expensive. The flooding, it wasn't always this way. You know, we get basement backups and then we get streams in the... So you're talking right, right here. Right here in front of our house. The fight is on to save Jefferson Chalmers. Jake Jurgensen, one of its leaders. Is this neighborhood at risk? Very much so. Yeah, I would say that we are at a critical point in our neighborhood's trajectory and its history. If we don't fix the problems that are happening now, our neighborhood will go the way of the dinosaur. There's no question about it. Then the water receded. And we I first met John Myers back in 2019. It was record high water on the Great Lakes, the Detroit River, causing the canals to overflow. The Army Corps and the city volunteers sandbagged this, which is Good because I did breach the uh, the cap by an inch or so. With the heavy rains, the attention now, what goes on down below? This was just rebuilt in October and it was collapsed from the construction. They ran a truck over and, and it just caved in and so they rebuilt it in all cement and bricks and such and, and ever since then it hasn't drained. So There were some serious mistakes made about a hundred years ago when they filled this piece of land in. I mean this is this is all of the Grand Marais or the Great Marsh. Basically this was a village called Fairview Village. It went from Waterworks Park to Cadu in Gross Point. But there were six automobile manufacturers right in this this neighborhood. Chalmers, Continental, Hudson, and they wanted the tax base. So they said, look, we'll we'll suck you into Detroit and you can go into our sewer system. An historic neighborhood with an historic combined sewer system where sewage water mixes with storm water. Too much rain, you get combined sewer overflows. When you try to throw everything into pipes underground, they fill up. And once they get to a certain point, the city goes down to the Fox Creek and they remove the log jams and they let it go right out the canal. And that's to keep it out of the basements. But 
2014, 2016, 2019, and then 2021, I had a swimming pool in my basement along with a lot of other people. It trashed basements across Detroit, especially the east side. So I'll tell you, when the flood came, everybody on that side of the street lost their car. Because every time it rains here, we get flooding. We get flooding in the streets, and that, that's eroding things. Things are swelling and going down and swelling and going down. My house is moving. Right, right there. Well, it just the looks wet. like it's damp. Yeah. Probably all the time it looks damp, huh? Yeah, yeah. Along the canals, tiger dams intended to ward off high water, although lake levels have been receding of late. That orange thing, yeah. Now, has that been there a while? It was, it was put there after 2016. That was the solution. That's not a permanent solution, is no. it? No. Well, it's not going away any time soon, is it? I hope it goes away. It's not doing anything now but junking up the place. That and all the sandbags that went down. Waterfront estates with boat docks. That's nice. But the tiger dams? And it'd be better without sewage in the water. It's only supposed to be utilized in emergency situations. But of course, more than twice a year for the last dozen years, we've had uh, discharges into the canal. Greg Sawyer wants better notification when the sewage discharges happen. I mean, we've had people, we've caught people fishing in the water the day after the discharge and nobody's informed them that that is not the appropriate thing to do. We have people that swim in the canal. We do know that raw sewage is being dumped into the canals. So what we want to do is test the toxicity. Grab the handle so you don't lose it all. And we decided to tap our local teens who are in environmental science class at King High School and take it to the lab and see what the results are. want to be below that time, but above the second line. Has there been a lot of testing of the water here? I don't think so. So this is something that we're doing grassroots on our own. And so we're going to get a reference point of the bacteriological load as well as the chemical load so that when there is an event, we can have a team out here within 24 to 36 hours to take a sample and compare the two so we can say this is what happens when we have a global climate event in the city. There's federal money to upgrade the region's infrastructure. Jefferson Chalmers will need a lot of it. We got to look at all the options. We've got to work with uh, the federal government. We've got to understand um, how climate is changing and shifting and what that means when you live along any major body of water. So we've got to understand everything and how are you now going to live in that area. One proposed fix, install locks separating the canals from the river. It would be a permanent situation until they got the crane back out there to pull it back out. It would well, not... Why? What would that do and what did you think about it? Well, it's not the answer. Uh, closing off waterways doesn't stop water. Blocking the canals, rejected by the residents, some who want consideration for other, bigger, bolder ideas. What we're talking about is a demonstration project. A demonstration project takes a look at a variety of technologies and said, how can we deploy these different technologies? Not new technologies, uh, really, just not charge. seen so, so much in uh, these parts. If you take a look at this. This plastic uh, uh, device is driven into the soil. Um, and it allows for infiltration to happen more quickly. More than that, Jurgensen is suggesting underground stormwater holding tanks installed under vacant fields and city streets. A lot of digging. Better the water there than in people's basements. I don't know if that can be successful, but those are the type of things that need to come together so we can have all the facts and say what is going to be successful and the reason why. And also what's the cost associated with that. That was a pretty ambitious plan from what I saw. And who's offering up all the property where these takes might go, even if there are the many, many millions of dollars it'd take to do it? And if the water's a problem, maybe you ought to move. <laughs> Uh, well, that's that's one option. Um, you have to think about affordability. Not everybody has that option, unfortunately. Um, so what you can do is just work together as citizens and um, organize ourselves, educate ourselves, and figure out some solutions. Why do you stay here with all this water? I was born and raised in Detroit. I'm a lifelong Detroiter. Most of my, all my children live here. Um, I really like, who doesn't like living off the water? Given what climate change is and water levels rising, changes, we're all going to have to adapt. Not to say that they can't have what they have, it's just going to have to change, is probably a more accurate. And we don't know what that change is unless we work together.
we already know what the problem is. We don't need to investigate a million other things. We know what the issue is. We just need to now find a solution of how to fix our infrastructure. And I know that costs a lot of money, but I mean, our neighborhood and the people in this community, we're worth, we're worth it. <laughs> we're worth you guys spending the money. We've got to solve these problems or the residents in our neighborhood and, and not just our neighborhood, Dearborn, the Detroit Aviation Sub, Morningside, the areas that are plagued with these chronic infrastructure problems will continue to see their property values go down because they won't have the resources to invest in their homes to improve their value and have them appreciate over time. So we have to solve these. We don't have a choice. Or well, like I said, our neighborhood will go the way of the dinosaurs. And for more on the impact of global climate change, make sure to watch Nova's Weathering the Future here on Detroit Public TV on April 12th at 9 p.m. Let's turn now to our Future of Work series. Millennials make up the largest share of the U.S. workforce, and the future of work in Michigan will depend upon keeping young professionals here. In a recent virtual town hall, I spoke with Let's Detroit Ambassador Marjace Miles about his efforts to attract a millennial workforce to Southeast Michigan. Just tell us about a little bit of your journey. Were, were you born and raised here? Have you been here the whole time? Have you left and come back? Yeah, so, yep, born and raised here in, in Metro Detroit. Spent most of my life in Oak Park. I uh, went to Ferndale High School for high school. Went to Wayne State University for undergrad. I went to the University of Michigan Raw School of Business for my MBA. So Michigan, Michigan, Michigan. What about Southeast Michigan, the Detroit area, has, has kept you here? Because again, you have options. Marketing and, and marketing with an automotive industry was really appealing to me. I mean, that's an industry that is growing and evolving each day. And so for me, what's best for my career, what's best for my family is is chasing after that. In your experience, because you've, you've been here, you've been in the industry and, and you've played multiple roles in the industry as well. Have you seen that there are opportunities for millennials who are at a professional level as you are? Has, has that been something that you, you've noticed? Like, you know, obviously you're doing well, but there yeah. are other opportunities for people. For so long, we're expecting that big fish that, you know, Amazon World Headquarters 2.0. Remember when that discussion happened? Yep. But that's not how we're set up not as a region, not as a city. We're set up like the bad boys. We're set up like the Pistons where you yes. have one small piece added to another piece, added to another piece. Part of one of the things you do, as, as we said also in the open, is your work with Let's Detroit. You said you've been doing that for a couple of years. So just tell us, for those who are unaware, what is Let's Detroit and what your role is as an ambassador has been? Yeah, so Let's Detroit is a part of the Detroit Chamber of Commerce. And Really, Less Detroit is just a connector. Um, Detroit, Metro Detroit, it's, it's small to us locals, but for transplants, people trying to enter this area, it can, be, it can be pretty big. I mean, it's hard to find your network, the best companies to work for, places to visit, organizations to you know, create an impact on. And what Less Detroit's goal is, is to make that easier. They wanna connect right. young professionals like myself to other young professionals point blank period. What they're finding is we can Google best restaurants to go to. You can LinkedIn best places to work. But when it comes from somebody that's experienced it, myself, it, 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 it's more impactful. Um, I'll give you examples. So I'm, I'm a black male. I'm married. I live in the suburbs. I work in automotive. That's my experience. It's unique. And I can share that gospel of Detroit with, let's say, 10 people um, right. at different bars, at networking events, but that only goes so far. What Less Detroit is equipped to do is amplify that. What kind of difference does it make to actually have a real life person mm -hmm. help you figure these things out when you're essentially considering and, and looking into what is a major life shift? So this might be a millennial answer, but I think connection, <laughs> connections are important. I right. mean, as we're making these decisions, it's a lot harder to leave an area if you have those emotional and real connections to that area. And the only way to create it is not through a Google search, it's with somebody like myself or other less ambassadors showing you around. 
I'll, I'll give one example, not directly associated with Les Detroit, but at Ford, we have interns. They come in every year, you know, 11 weeks. Over the last few years, they've been remote. And we've only got a chance to bring them here for a week at a time or even a weekend at a time. Last year, when we had our interns come in for only four days, we, well, first of all, we packed so much into those four days. I don't know how right. they survived. We, we floated the Huron River. Uh, we took them to the DIA. We took them to sporting events. We had a barbecue. But oh, man. the amount of times that people said, I did not know Detroit had so much to offer. Wow, I did not know that the riverfront was so cool. I didn't know, and this is a quote, I didn't know Michigan had beaches. It really is. You know, how often do you encounter that type of thing? Because mm -hmm. when you say someone was unaware that Michigan has beaches and Michigan has the world's largest freshwater coastline, exactly. I, it, it just doesn't, is, is that a common thing where people are just lacking what we think is basic information about this place? 100%. And it's because <laughs> for so long, we haven't controlled our narrative. I mean, there's been obviously stuff in the news. We can go into the social, political, climate and things like that if we wanted to. But at the end of the day, the news has controlled what is Detroit, what is Michigan for way too long. And until we get to a place where we're taking that narrative back, that's that's what's going to that's what's going to happen. Muslims around the world are celebrating Ramadan through April 20th. It's a holy month of prayer and fasting. As part of the Interfaith Leadership Council of Metro Detroit's Religious Diversity Journey Series, local student Maria learned about the traditions of Islam during a visit to the Muslim Unity Center in Bloomfield Township. Peace be upon you. My name is Dima Al Gamal. I am a member of the Muslim Unity Center Interfaith Committee and a formal board member. The Muslim Unity Center was founded in the early 90s, and uh, there's about 300 families uh, who are members of the Muslim Unity Center. Muslim Unity Center is home away from home to a lot of community members. Maria is going to be our guest today. We'll invite her through multiple sessions to uh, explore our values and our tradition, the Muslim uh, faith traditions. She will learn about the fundamentals and origin of Islam. She will also learn about the contributions of Islam to civilization, as well as the role of women in Islam and much more. Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. Welcome to the Unity Center. My name is Dima Al Gamal. I'm an interfaith committee member. Welcome to the journey. Let's start. This is Patrick and Arif. Hi. Hi, Assalamu alaikum, Maria. Nice to meet you. What are the fundamentals of Islam? Uh, the fundamentals of Islam. Well, you know, Islam is built upon five pillars, the first of which is called the testification of faith, the Shahada. And it basically it states that you believe that there is no God worthy of worship except God, one God, and that the Prophet Muhammad is his messenger. Is Islam a new religion? Muslims believe that from the time of Adam and Eve all the way up to the present and cont uh, continuing through a line of prophets and revealed scriptures that Islam came as a completion of that chain of revelation. Who are Muslims? Muslims represent every race and nationality across the world. Did you know that not all Muslims are Arabs? Only 15% of the world's Muslims are Arabs. Here at the Unity Center, you'll find people with origins in the Arab world, from East Asia, from Africa, um, all over the world. How are you doing? Uh, we're just uh, setting up decorations for Eid. What's Eid? Eid is the Arabic translation for a holiday, and Muslims celebrate two holidays, Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. How do Muslims celebrate Eid? They celebrate Eid by gathering at the local mosque for special congregational prayers and services. They give charity to those that are in need, and they also gather with family and friends and celebrate with good food, fun, new clothes, and plenty of gifts. What do you say to a Muslim during Eid? We say Eid Mubarak, which means a blessed holiday during both Eids. How many times do Muslims pray each day? Muslims pray five times each day. When you see a Muslim pray, you will most likely 
see them going through different motions. You'll see them standing up, you'll see them bowing down, you'll see them then prostrating. This is the greatest way of showing one's submission to God. Do Muslims only pray, pray in the mosque? So for a Muslim, he or she are able to pray anywhere, any place. The moment the time comes in for prayer, they are asked to pray. This is why some students prefer to uh, pray in a quiet place in school. Do men and women pray in the same place in the mosque? The answer is that women are given the option. In the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, women and men prayed in the same prayer hall. So it is permissible Islamically for men and women to pray in the same prayer hall. Can you tell me about what Islam has contributed to civilization? That's a brilliant question. As you can see from these 1001 invention posters that the Muslims contributed to schools, hospitals, the universe, and the Muslim civilization. And this ran from the 8th century all the way to the 16th century. And this was uh, titled the Golden Age for the Muslims. Can you explain to me why you're covering your head? Sure, that's a question I get asked often. Islam teaches modesty for both men and women. The Islamic dress code for women is referred to as hijab. So once a Muslim girl reaches the age of puberty, she will cover her body with loose clothing, um, only showing her hands and her face. And hijab looks different in different parts of the world because it's influenced by culture. And you'll see some of the moms and the daughters outside. Um, some of them are wearing hijab, some of them aren't. And there might be a little, some subtle differences in the way that they choose to wear hijab. What is a woman's role in Islam? So Islam teaches respect for women regardless of what their role is as mothers, daughters, wives. The Quran has many verses and through the prophetic teachings that emphasize respect for women and teaches equality of men and women in their deeds and their spirituality. Does Islam support arranged marriage? No, not at all. In Islam, for a marriage to be valid, both the bride and the groom have to give their consent to the marriage, otherwise it's not valid. Thanks for a answering my questions about women in Islam. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for asking. Thank you for coming today, Maria, and for visiting the Muslim Unity Center and learning about your Muslim friends and, uh, and neighbors. And hopefully you can come again and bring your friends and your family. Thank you for showing me around. My pleasure. Come again. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Now, let's take a look at what's happening in Metro Detroit this weekend and beyond. Here's Peter Worf of 90.9 WRCJ with today's One Detroit Weekend. Metro Detroit has a ton to offer people over the weekend and beyond. Here's what's coming up. For those who love sacred music, Old St. Mary's Church in Detroit will have a concert at 8 p.m. this Friday. The St. Mary Choir and Orchestra will be singing Rheinberger's Stabat Mater and the music of Mendelssohn. Also up on Friday night at 8 p.m., it's Poetry and Music, Worlds Collide. At the Cube at the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, LaShawn Phoenix Moore hosts the evening that will feature some great R&B, rap, and poetry artists, including Jody and Ms. Corona, Peace Bell, and more. Starting this Saturday, April 8th, at the Detroit Opera, it's opening night of Osvaldo Goliath's Fountain of Tears, which reimagines the life of revolutionary poet Federico Garcia Lorca. Its opera meets flamenco. This show offers up dance, projections, poetry, and WRCJ is broadcasting the opening night performance live. And here's something for the musical enthusiasts out there. Matilda the Musical is playing through April 23rd at the Baldwin Theater in Royal Oak, inspired by the classic story by Roald Dahl. The show is filled with high-energy numbers and catchy songs. It's fun for the whole family. Looking into next week, there's nothing quite like hearing a big band. On Monday, April 10th at 7.30 p.m., come and enjoy some big band music in Detroit. The Wayne State Jazz Big Band and Orchestra performs at the Cube at the Detroit Symphony Orchestra that night. 
There's just so much art and live performances to enjoy in and around the city. For 90.9 WRCJ, I'm Peter Wharf. Here's more of what's happening ahead. Hope to see you around town and have a great weekend. That will do it for this week's One Detroit. Thanks for watching. Head to the One Detroit website for all the stories we're working on. Follow us on social media and sign up for our weekly newsletter. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia and Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Nissan Foundation and viewers like you.